Hello and thanks for coming back. This video is a continuation to my previous video on how to put license files onto Google Drive. If you haven't seen the earlier video then this video will make very little sense. This video is literally just a continuation from the earlier video and most of what I show here won't make any sense if you haven't seen the earlier videos. But I will leave a link in the description to a playlist that has the other videos in this series. So now if you have seen the earlier videos and you're here for the continuation, let's get started. Now some little things that you might want to change to this. Uh, so what we have here so far works, no problem. I will enhance this a little further because there are some things I just need to warn you about. Firstly, this file. Uh, when it expires, you're going to need to create a new file, obviously. If you delete this first and then copy the new file in, you will get a new number from Google Drive and you probably don't want to do that. So every time you get a new file, simply drag it in and allow it to replace the existing file. That way you'll keep the same number. If for some reason your customer allows their license to lapse and you do remove it and then they come back and pay you again, you will have to issue them with the new registration number, the same technique we had before. You may be tempted to say, I don't need to have the let me go back to the code here. Open this file. You may be tempted to say you don't need these expiries because when the license expires, if the customer hasn't paid to renew, you can simply delete the file from Google Drive. The problem with that approach, these files are just files on Google Drive. There is nothing to stop your customer from simply downloading this file, loading it to their own Google Drive, and then getting their own registration ID code and using that and that would work forever if there's nothing inside this file to say when it expires. So just remember that. Next thing, these files are now on the web. And as I said, they're available to anyone who has the ID. Now that might be a little bit hard to find, but they are publicly available. And it contains your product name and the customer's account number. Uh, these dates really don't mean anything but this is information that I would want to protect. So I'm going to make some more changes to the code to protect that. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into this license file check and you can see that it makes calls to keygen and here is keygen. I'm going to create a new function that I'm just going to call hash. can copy most of this and just make some modifications. So the key gen was meant to include the product key when it creates this hash. And that's fine because there are some cases where you need to include that hidden value. Uh, hash is just going to create the hashed value. So I'm just going to call this, I don't actually need key string. I'll change the name of this to data char. Okay, so I'm simply converting that data into a character array. Remember this, it's important. Uh, I still have my crypt char, so I'm still using SHA-256 to convert data char into crypt char. Uh, I'm going to change this significantly though. Uh, I'm not going to use base64 anymore, I'm going to change these two ASCII characters. So I'll get the size of the crypt char that's come back. I know that should be a fixed size because I'm using SHA-256, but I'm just going to put that there to make sure. So what I'm doing, I'm looping through each character in this crypt char array. I'm using the string format with the percent dot two X and that will convert that single character into a string that is the ASCII representation in hex for that character. Uh, so in the end, I get a result that is just an ASCII. It's a, a base 16 version of this 
encrypted code. So here in Keygen, I can save some code by simply saying, I'm going to return the hash of the key string. So let's just get rid of all of that. And then of course I need to declare this function. And I'm going to make it public because I want to use it from other places. Quick compile to make sure that's all good. Now if I go to my license web generator, I can make a few changes. I don't want to store just the account. I'm going to call the hash on that account. So now that becomes encrypted. And I'm going to do the same with the product name. So now if you do download the file, you can't interpret these values. It does mean that I need to make the same change down here when I'm doing this comparison. And I just don't care about the expiry. Uh, and you do need to be able to interpret those. So I can't really hash those because you can't convert them back. I think that's all fine. Let me run that again. I'm leaving the registration empty because I'm creating a file. I should have closed this first. I wonder if that worked. Yes. So I still have this checksum at the beginning, but now the customer's account number is hashed and the product code is hashed. Uh, and you can see now these are all hex characters instead of base 64. So anyone who downloads this file now can't read that information. If I go back to Google Drive, I can simply upload that, replace the existing file, I'll get that ID code because that should be the same, run the test, I put the registration code in. I go back here I can see now testing valid license the account code correct product code correct so obviously this is not the real product code this is not the real account code inside your expert you would have to hash the customer's account number and you have to hash the product code so that they match these values uh, and I've still got the expiry in the grace period there's one more thing I want to do just to make this a little bit more secure and that is because Anyone who has that registration code can download this file. We've now protected the contents of the file, but you can see the name here still says product one underscore and then the account number. So I want to protect that as well. And this will add some complication for you. So for this, I'm going back to the licensewebcheck.mqh file. Here I have product name underscore account. I'm going to change that to hash product name underscore account and that will protect the file name. Let me go back here and I'll remember to close it this time. License web generator, I run that. Same product code, key and customer account number. Okay, uh, just right click here and do refresh. And now here is a new file with a completely unintelligible name but that is the file with the same contents. In fact, if I bring this up, there's no difference in the contents between these two files because this is still the account number. This is still the product code. I still have the expiries here, and this is the hash checksum. But now if I go and do the upload thing again, here is my file. I can upload that. And anyone who manages to download this file now can't interpret anything from the name. Uh, I have to do the share again. And this is my new share. I'll just get that piece of information. here 
my generator. I'll paste that in as well so I don't lose it. And if I now and we have here initialize now testing license, valid license, all the same information. So that all works fine. Where this will cause you a bit of a problem, let me go back here. You now have file names that you cannot understand and there's nothing in the contents of this file to tell you who the customer is, what the product is, or what the account number is that you've licensed. So for maintenance purposes, you probably need to keep a register somewhere that matches these up against the product and the account number. But this makes it nice and secure for the customer. They don't need to worry that any of their information is being exposed on the web because anyone who does come across this file cannot reverse engineer these codes to get the customer account number. Now, I think that is everything. Um, just to refresh, I've taken the original license file check, made a small number of modifications to that, inherited from it in this license web check, and then in the web check, all I've had to do is add a load data function, which is specific to loading from the web, and a license path because I'm actually using a different path name. I could have made this the same path name, it doesn't really matter, but uh, I've added a license path in here. And of course I've added the registration and the account because they are extra pieces of information that I want in here. If you're using this in an expert, you'll want something like the license web generator here to create the files in the first place. But in your expert, you will then want to do basically what is in this test to download the license, check it, and then you'll want to go through your own tests against the expiry time and the grace period and so on to make sure that this is a valid license for you. Uh, you do need to test the account number and the product because if it just had the account number, the customer could use this one file for all of the products. Uh, and the account number there, although it is possible that two customers with different brokers will have the same account number, the chances are so small, I just can't be bothered worrying about it. And now, just as a final comment, with each of my two earlier videos, I have had two sets of comments. One comment saying, but when I distribute the MQH file to the customer, they can see all of the code. My answer to that is, it sounds like you don't know how this works. You don't distribute the MQH files, you only distribute the EX4s or the EX5 files. Okay. The other comment I get, and I get this quite a lot, people say, what if someone decompiles the code? Okay. Since build 600, I have not seen any successful decompiled code of MetaTrader EX4s or EX5s. That doesn't mean they don't exist. I haven't seen them. They used to exist all over the place, but they seem to have disappeared since build 600. If you're saying, but there are lots of people out there who are advertising that they can decompile files and all you have to do is deposit lots of cash into a crypto account, then maybe contact me because I have a bridge for sale. So with that, I'm not saying they can't be decompiled. I'm just saying it's unlikely. And this is what we have. So if this has been useful for you, I hope it has. Uh, then remember, click the like button and subscribe for more videos. And with luck, this is the last of the one part series on how to protect your files. So until the next time, thank you for watching.